Hello everyone, welcome back to another one of our Through the Bible studies. Today we're going to be going through the book of Colossians. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with these studies, our goal here isn't to replace personal Bible study, but to equip you for it. So as you're going to be reading the book of Colossians, this study is meant to be a starting point to essentially tell you the who, what, when, where, why, and how, the major themes to look for in the study, the historical background of the study, and of course to give an open conversation about anything you read in this book to accompany the study. So with that in mind, let's start with the author who physically wrote this book, and note I say physically wrote this book. It was Paul the Apostle. All of the epistles, the writings of the apostles, and by the way, well, clarify this as we go. If I use a term you're not familiar with, don't be afraid to ask. I'll happily do so, and I'll do my best to equip you for that as well as we go along. But an apostle was a sent out one, and it would essentially be, they used it back then as a term to describe a cargo ship. It wasn't necessarily significant in of itself. What mattered was, was what it was carrying. And in the same way, we'd look at like the mailman today. They don't really express the thoughts or opinions of the letters or the packages that they're delivering. They're simply representatives. They were sent out by UPS or by Amazon or by, you know, fill in the blank. And that's the point that's being made. Paul was sent out by God. He was representing God. And in the same way, he would be considered, in the same terms, a prophet of God in Old Testament language. And a prophet just means a spokesman, someone who speaks on behalf of another. So in that context as well, the apostles were sent out by God and the prophets were spokesmen of God. But nonetheless, the source remains the same, which is why I made the specification we're talking about a physical penning or an actual author, the mind behind this message. Paul the Apostle wrote this book as a book of doctrine following history, the three sections of the Old and New Testament, history, doctrine, and prophecy, what happened, what men did with what happened, and what God did with what happened. Speaking from God, speaking from man's perspective, inspired by God, and God's focus on the events that took place in history, what happened. This historical background essentially makes sense of what was going on and how these men were feeling when this was happening. And as well, once we've clarified how men felt, let's focus instead on how God felt. That's the third and final section. Old Testament, it's fairly straightforward. From Genesis to Esther, it is chronological history. But then you get to the book of Job and we start over in Genesis again. Why? Because you're in a new section. And Job, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Song of Solomon, Proverbs, not in that order, they all fall into that doctrine category. It's focusing on the perspectives of King Lemuel, King Solomon, David, the sons of Korah, Moses, Job, and the others. But when we're talking about all these things, again, just as side details, the prophecy section, Isaiah through Malachi, what about the New Testament? Well, the history would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, four biographies from four different perspectives on the life of Jesus, a historical event, followed by the book of Acts, which was a follow-up on what happened afterwards. It was actually originally just, you know, the entire volume of Luke. But the interesting thing about this as well is that when you get into Romans, suddenly the order seems to have started over again. Is this something that Jesus wrote? Is this something that Paul wrote? Well, every book begins, fortunately, with a penned name signed, with the exception of one, and that would be Hebrews. But we can test that as well according to these standards, and it passes. But here's the interesting thing, is when you look at this order and you see, okay, Paul the Apostle, Romans through possibly Hebrews, but definitely Philemon, then we start over with the authorship of Peter, then with John, then with Jude, James, so forth. You get this structure to the New Testament, and as long as you know when it's being spoken, you know what kind of book you're reading, then you're not going to say, oh, so it was a historical event that Paul encouraged the church to continue in prayer for him. Kind of. I mean, in a moment of history, yes, he spoke those words, but it wasn't a historically significant event. It was during this time in history, Paul told someone personally to pray for him because it was modeling a Christ-like life. And that's ultimately the point that's being made here. It's a different type of book, not by any means fictional, but still making the point in a different category. And that's how the Old and New Testament was organized. 
Now, we talked about the when historically. When exactly in history did this book get written? That would be in 62 AD. Now, why am I being so specific about that? Because we actually can narrow down archaeologically when this book would have been written. Colossians was one of several of the prison epistles, and they were titled as such not because they talked about prison, but Paul wrote them while he was in prison. If you remember our time in the book of Acts, as well as the books of Ephesians and Galatians, not Galatians, Ephesians and Philippians, he wrote these books when he was awaiting his first trial before Emperor Nero, and this is something that was acknowledged by Christians and non-Christians during this time outside of the Bible. Now, if Nero died in the late 60s, it would be kind of hard for Paul to have this letter awaiting trial before him when he had already died. So we could at least say it was before this point. Likewise, it would be difficult for Paul to write this epistle in prison before he had been arrested, which, if we remember in the book of Acts, we're given a very carefully laid out timeline by Luke of when he was arrested in Jerusalem, when, when he was taken up to Caesarea and later throughout Asia Minor, used as a political tool for the Jews until he used his right as a Roman citizen to appeal to Caesar. And then it was from there that he was taken by ship to, well, he made it almost to Rome. They had a shipwreck incident. But nonetheless, he was able to make it ashore. He stayed with his Roman guard, and they were able to escort him to prison, which is verified by both Christian sources and non-Christian sources, including even the Roman records, the prison rule at this time. So when we're talking about all these things, we can pretty much know for certain at least the year of when this book was written. And because it was not only specified when in Paul's life, but also the details surrounding it give us a fairly clear picture, like anything else in, excuse me, in ancient history, we can form fairly sound conclusions, but also recognize that as much. Paul's writing this letter in prison. And when you see the kind of language that he's using, you're just kind of like, this guy's awful cheery to be in the kind of situation he was, which was the whole point. When he focused on the person of Jesus, he didn't really care about his circumstances. And that is what this book is all about. And I say book, it was an epistle, which is a writing of an apostle. And it was actually a letter that was written to the Christians in Colossae. The Colossians were citizens of Colossae. It was a city that was in the Greek province of the Roman Empire, would be known today as Asia Minor, and uh, actually no, it was known today as Turkey, it was known back then as Asia Minor, and Colossae was actually an interesting city. It was basically within walking distance of two other cities. They were known as Hierapolis and Laodicea. Now Laodicea is mentioned two more times in the Bible, apart from the book of Acts. Firstly, at the end of this book, Paul tells the Colossians the Laodiceans also got a letter, read it, and also you share this letter with them. And it wouldn't have been hard because they were essentially neighbors. But also make a point, we, we don't know much about Hierapolis, but Jesus also wrote to the church in Laodicea in the book of Revelation chapter 3, and we'll talk about that when we get there. Now, you would know that, or you would rather notice, that our Bibles don't include the book to the Laodiceans. There's no Laodiceans, right? Well, apart from Jesus' letter, we don't have access to that historically. It wasn't preserved. But fortunately, we do have references to it in the writings of early church fathers, people who were alive at this time. And they essentially pointed out, without going into their insanely long quoting of the matter, that everything that was in that letter was also already given to us in the other letter. So even though it's physically absent, the message isn't. And we don't have to worry about that because these books are in our Bibles for a reason. And what reason is that? Well, because Paul was known as an apostle. Now, anyone can say those words, but words mean something. If I say I'm a capital A apostle, that means that I was sent out by, in this context, God. I'm speaking on behalf of God and therefore I'm claiming the same authority the same opinion behind my words that actually is coming from God. They're not my words, they're God's. I'm just the messenger. How do you test that? Well, obviously, it would have to be a fairly strict test because if it was broad or if it was vague, then we'd have 
Well, firstly, a lot more books in our Bible than we do now, but secondly, the message wouldn't necessarily be coherent because you wouldn't be able to discern non-Scripture from Scripture without a strict standard. And who was that standard? Well, like I said, the Old Testament equivalent of a uh, an apostle, someone sent out by God, would be a prophet. And who better to start with as far as your standard for a prophet than the first one? And I'm not talking about Adam, not talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, or any of the others. The first person that God spoke through to put his words into writing. Note, he spoke to plenty of people before this time. But the first person God spoke to to put his words into writing was Moses. Moses was a guy that not only in a very public and dramatic way was confirmed by God as his man that you can read it in Exodus 19. God physically manifested a fraction of his glory on Mount Sinai, spoke his law, the Ten Commandments and the other 603 that came after and said, this, this is my law. And the nation of Israel is like, uh, I hear you, but I'm not going to be able to hear much of anything if this happens every week. <laughs> And so, God said, listen to Moses then. His words will be mine. You recognize him as my messenger. So, very public, very obvious, and was confirmed not just by the affirmation on the mountain, but also backed up by miracles, the fact that Moses' information recorded was accurate given the historical time frame, and he laid down a consistent pattern of who God was, his stance towards sin, his positions towards sin and sinners, wanting to show mercy, but also not compromising in justice, knowing that sin is serious and not wiggling in between those matters, and keeping that consistent doctrine laying forward. Well, essentially, this was the four standards that all of the books in our Bibles were held to. First, they needed to be accurate. If God's talking, he's going to get his facts straight. Secondly, it's going to be consistent. We're talking about the same God here. He's not going to change his mind on certain things over others. Now note, there's a difference between speaking from man's perspective about God, which is why it's important to know what kind of book you're reading, history, doctrine, or prophecy. But also, and even more importantly, not just recognizing him maintaining those stances, but especially knowing what those stances are. That God is a God of love by character, that God is perfect by nature, that God has these standards and that we haven't kept them, that he offers salvation to any who are receiving them, and that he loves you. <laughs> if he's a God that's prone to change, like Loki or something from you know Avengers, well then, if he loved me yesterday, maybe loves me today, but prone to change, how much confidence do I have he'll love me tomorrow? None. And that's the whole point. God's not going to present himself as this inconsistent hormonal teenager, because he isn't. And that's the whole point. We need consistency as well as accuracy. Third is, of course, as was pointed out, first-hand accountability. You needed to be the eyewitness or the direct associate of the eyewitness. Good example of that would be Luke. He took from the eyewitnesses themselves the information he reported in his gospel, so there would be that direct accountability. If there was false information, they could ask for their name. So, for example... Who would know better about what Mary was feeling when she found out she was going to be the, the girl that every Jewish girl hoped she would be, the mother of the Messiah? Maybe Mary? Who <laughs> know better how she felt about you being born than your mom? Because <laughs> she was there? And in the same way, that's why you see all this association between Matthew and Mark's accounts, because it was even acknowledged that Mark's account wasn't an orderly one, but Luke went out of his way to set these accounts in order. How? He didn't see any of it, but his sources did. And so when we compare that, say, to Matthew, who was the source for all this information, we're going off the eyewitnesses either way. And this also would tie into the Old Testament, because understand, direct accountability was also legally necessary. If I'm going to say, okay, I step up and I say, this is from God, it's a word from God, they test me according to those standards, right? Backing up and see how you compare to Moses. You are a false prophet. You have said something incorrect. You're misrepresenting the character of God. Something's not lining up here. One of these things does not belong, and you are one of the others. Well, the punishment would be death by stoning. 
with rocks, taking up giant rocks and pelting you to death. And that would be a capital offense, and much necessarily so, especially when they were forming God's words, because think about this. In the cults that are being tolerated in our world today, no, I'm not saying we should go out and kill them. I'm saying we're talking about something that has huge repercussions, huge consequences to those dragged into it. If someone's essentially leading a spiritual marching band that's destination is hell, saying, okay, we'll take the truth, but I'll twist it for my own prophet for the fact that I'll call myself a prophet so I get extra wives, so I get prestige, so that I get fill in the blank. Hundreds of thousands of people ending up separated from God forever because of the words of a liar being welcomed and left untested, which again will be full accountability of the people who fell for it, but also doubly accountable for the one who came up with that lie in the first place. This was not to be tolerated in the nation of Israel. And so they'd say, you have been sentenced to death because we have examined your message under a court of law when you have fair trial and you have been exposed as a liar. You say, no, it wasn't me. It's that guy, he, he told me about this. So they'd go to him and say, you've been sentenced to death. You told him to share a false message in the name of God. No, it wasn't me. I, I heard it from like my, my mom's sewing partner or whatever. And on it would go. So basically it was this, you know, kindergarten playground idea of just like, I didn't do it, he did. So if you were to share something in the name of God, the third standard was you were either directly accountable or they wouldn't hear it. Is this coming from you? Are you the one sharing this? Because if you're lying, it's all on you or it's all on your source. But also understand if you're telling the truth, we know your source and we'll listen to him because we could care less what you think. We're listening to his words, not yours. And that's what's being tested here. That's the third standard, direct accountability, eyewitness testimony. The fourth, fairly straightforward, is miracles. If God's going to speak through someone, he'll back up his words with deeds. And every time that you see a miracle taking place in biblical history, as well as in the world today, it is always to confirm a reason to trust these words as God's to someone who had no reason to otherwise. That's why the ten plagues were a thing, to confirm to Pharaoh, as well as to the rest of the nation, Moses is my guy. But also understand this as well. Why did Jesus perform so many miracles? It wasn't to show off. It was for the purpose of confirming his word. Well, why aren't miracles happening in my life today? Because we have the miracles we need to trust the information we have. If you need a miracle, you'll get a miracle. But understand as well, God's not doing this stuff every day. We can get caught into that trap of thinking, oh, this just seems like this stuff's happened all the time. If God was really working in my life, it would happen every day, like in the book of Acts. The book of Acts covers 30 years of history, and there's around 18 miracles, if I remember correctly, in the whole book. So that's maybe a miracle every other year. And it's to confirm the word, but understand that's not an everyday occurrence either. Miracles, by definition, need to be rare so that they get our attention. Why? Because they're one of the criterion of knowing whether this is something from God or not. And Paul, the apostle, was held to the standard and passed. That's why we listen to this book. Now, what's in the book? Well, apart from, obviously, the fact that it was addressing the Colossians, the people of Colossae, this church was a group of believers that had a very close connection to Paul, and in fact, they got more than one letter. Apart from the letter to Laodicea, it was also the hometown of Philemon, who got his own private letter that's also in our Bibles here today, and we'll discuss it verse by verse when we get to it, adjacent to Heriopolis and Laodicea. But understand, the whole purpose of this book is to lay down the character of Jesus Christ. And let's start, obviously, with his name. What does Jesus Christ mean? Well, Jesus, his name, that would be the you know, Greek rendition of it. In English, it would be Joshua. In Hebrew, it would be Yahshua. And that's a combination of two words, the name of God. And I apologize to my Jewish listeners. I'm not, not being disrespectful in any, any regard here. But the name of God, Yahweh, or Hashem in Hebrew groups, the name. They don't want to be disrespectful, but the name of God, the covenant name of God, combined with Hosea, which is a Hebrew name that meant Savior. So by taking these names, the reason why Jesus was called Yah Hosea, 
Yeshua was, he was literally being called God, our Savior. His name literally was his mission. And this is important to note because in our Western culture today, we, you know, get this idea in our heads of saying, oh, well, you just name your kid, you know, that because you like that name or maybe you know somebody who's named that. Well, back then they named them things that actually were relevant to who they were, their calling by God, or a significant event in history that took place during this time. perfect example would be Jacob and Esau, the twin sons of Isaac, and I believe it was Rebekah. The interesting thing was when Esau came out, the older twin brother, and I'm specifying older because this will be important in a second, they took baby out of mom and they took one look at him and only one word came to mind. Esau. Let's call him Esau, which meant, (laughs) I can't even say it without laughing. The word means hairy. So, So when the baby's born, he's just like, oh, Chewbacca, that's nice. And so they're, yeah, that's that's literally what was happening. But they, they take Esau to mom and they notice the legs got a little resistance going on. So they look and they see a baby's arm holding on to big brother. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to get born first. Get back in here. I'm sure mom would have been very happy about that. But <laughs> anyway, so they look at that and they say, oh my gosh, Jacob. Yaakov, that means heel grabber, someone who tries to trip you up, a cheater. And and that literally was their names. I know God renamed Jacob, cheater, into Israel, which means governed by God or God's prince. But the point is being made here. Names are significant biblically. And in the culture that Jesus was born into, his name was literally describing his mission. I know he had other names, Emmanuel, God with us, God our righteousness, that's what we'll call him in the millennial kingdom. But all these different things are describing who he is fundamentally as a person. And what was Jesus described as? God, our Savior. What about that last word, Jesus Christ, which we always refer to him? Well, remember, Christ was not his last name. Last names were actually more of a medieval invention that was meant to associate you either with a, you know, a coat of arms or with your job and occupation. That's why a lot of Jewish families are named Goldberg, for example, because they were oftentimes bankers. It's not the stereotype, it's just reality. But the interesting thing, too, is if we were to ask Jesus, you know, what's your last name? It would have been associated with his parents. He would be Ben Yosef son of Joseph. So, and again, we know the significance behind that wasn't actually the case, but you get the point. Jesus Christ was not his last name. Christ is a Greek word. It's the Greek word for the Hebrew, Mashiach, or Messiah, which in English is anointed one. And and back then, when you anointed somebody, you just dunk oil on their heads. To be anointed means you were being set aside for a unique purpose, and that was what? Well, in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 through 26, you can read it on your own time, a prophecy is given predicting mathematically to the day when Jesus would enter into Jerusalem, when the Messiah would show up. But before it gets into any of that, verse 24 describes his mission. He would, and I'll just paraphrase for now, but it would restore mankind's relationship back to God, keep every promise that God ever made, and ultimately do away with our sins, what's separating us from God. So with this description then, by calling Jesus the Christ, again, plenty of people have been called God's anointed. They would have been many Christ. David was known as the anointed king of Israel, right? You've been called, but for what purpose? To be the king. Well, what was Jesus the anointed one for? To restore our relationship with God. So when you call Jesus Christ, recognize that's not first and last name, and it's certainly not a swear word. It's calling him his name, Jesus, God our Savior, and it's calling him his title, the Christ. Which Christ? The one in Daniel 9.24. So going on from there, who is Jesus? Well, in the book of Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, Paul lays out five different titles for him. And these are all important to pay attention to and properly define in a biblical context because cults love to twist these things around. 
If you're ever going to find someone who's an anti-Christian cult, it's always going to center around actually four things, but one above anything else, the person of Jesus Christ. Tack onto that trusting of scripture, authority of their words over, ma over anyone else's, and of course the foundation of truth being on them and not God. But think about this as well. These titles need to be properly understood, and the titles are as follows. He's called the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, our creator and maintainer, the head of the church, and the firstborn from the dead. Now, all of these have significance, and this is what we're going to go over, as well as the follow-through on what Colossians talked about. The first title that he is given, apart from being called Jesus and Christ, which, as we discussed, are both significant, was the image of the invisible God. Now, follow along with me here. We're just going to lay out this little syllogism. According to John 4.24, Jesus himself specified God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God is spirit. Spirit can't be seen. I don't care how many YouTube videos you've seen of ghosts caught on camera, the immaterial can't be materially processed. Understood? So God is spirit. We can't see spirit. Jesus was God. Therefore, Jesus was spirit. Jesus took on human nature. Note, he didn't cease to be God. He simply set aside his function, his privileges as God, to be able to function as a man, capable of experiencing pain, capable of experiencing hunger and weakness and temptation, and ultimately physical death. Though his spirit would be just as much God as ours are maintained and eternal, right? We had a beginning, but we will not end because we came from an eternal source. In the same way, Jesus was, given on this title, God is spirit. We can't see spirit. Jesus was spirit. Jesus became a man. Men can be seen. Men are material. Therefore, Jesus was God that could be seen. That's what this means. He's the image of the invisible God. We're seeing God as a man. Everything, and you can see this as well in Colossians, everything that makes God God, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, that was Jesus. That's what we saw. And he himself affirmed that in John 14, verse 9. He says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, he doesn't say, I am the Father. He notes there's a unity between these two separate members of the Godhead, but we're talking about a unique being here. And the first thing that Jesus has specified, apart from being God our Savior, is God himself in an image that we can see. Because we can't see the Father or the Spirit, but we have been shown the Son, who became like one of us. The second title is the firstborn over all creation. Now this one's interesting especially given the fact that a lot of cult groups, especially Jehovah's Witnesses, say, see, this proves that he was created because you can't be the firstborn if you were never born. Well, that depends on your definition of firstborn. Yours, Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible Watchtower and Tract Society, or scriptures. Firstborn in the Bible is a title. And much like Son of God, it can mean one of two things. A biological one, meaning the order in which you were born. I'm the firstborn, meaning I was first born. Or it's a relational one. It's describing a title of honor. You're the first in the family. Now, Jesus obviously wasn't the biological offspring of the Father. Anyone who claims to be Christian and teaches that either doesn't know what they're talking about or is not Christian at all but he relates to the father as a son. It's a relational term, father and son. You, you've guys seen Guardians of the Galaxy too. You can have a dad, but he wasn't your daddy. That's the point that's being made. The father and the son are both co-equal as the only God, but in the uniqueness of the Trinity, much like the Spirit, they relate to each other as a father and a son. But likewise... That's what was pointed out. Firstborn could mean the first one born, or like every other time, 
It was used in the Bible. It's referring to the one in the family who inherited God's promises. For example, was Isaac the firstborn son of Jacob? The answer is no. Ishmael was technically the firstborn offspring of Abraham, but God called Isaac to carry on those promises that were made to him, that you would bless all nations, and that you know those who bless, bless you I will bless, those who curse you I will curse. Genesis chapter 12, if you want to get the exact words. But the point is, the firstborn wasn't the firstborn. It was a title, not a chronological order. Another example would be Jacob, like it was mentioned earlier. Was he the older twin brother, or was Esau the first one born? Actually, he was given that firstborn status when he was still in the womb, so it's doubly a title then. He wasn't even born yet, and yet called in that position of honor. Judah, he was the, no, that was Reuben, then Simeon, then Levi, then Judah. Judah was the fourth born son of Jacob, Israel. And of the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 men that made up the nation of Israel from their offspring, made up the Jewish people today, Judah inherited God's promises, and he was the fourth son born. And likewise, even if you're going in a ceremonial sense, who is the one who got the firstborn blessing of the family, the double portion of the inheritance? It was Joseph. Who was the tenth born son of Jacob? So catch this. I, I, I can go on. David, was he the oldest son of Jesse? No, he was the youngest. And yet he received the blessings. Uh, here's a little backtrack if we're already in the realm of weird birth stories. Perez, Perez and Zeram were twin sons of Tamar by Judah. Judah, when Tamar was giving birth, they saw that Zera was coming out of mom, and they you know, saw his arm and stuff, so they tied a little scarlet thread around him, and then, much to Tamar's discomfort, he went back into mom, and Perez got born first. He, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what that is, but I guess cheating is a modest way of putting it, but nonetheless, every single time we see this firstborn title put in scripture, it's never talking about the state in which you were born. It was the fact that you were the honored one in the family. So think about this. Jesus wasn't created. This has nothing to do with when or where or how he was born. He is over all creation. Yet given the title of firstborn, a position of honor over all of it, the firstborn over all creation, that's why his status as God was clarified first, so that you didn't get confused. Well, if he's God, that means he was never created. So when it says firstborn, we're talking about not his creation, because we've already clarified that title first. But now we're just talking about his position of honor over, over all creation, not from creation. Third, our creator and maintainer. Now that's fairly straightforward. It's only something God could be. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11, the 24 elders are worshiping somebody on the throne of heaven, and they say this to him, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So who can be called our creator? Who is the one who didn't just create us, but holds everything together and keeps it from falling apart? And yet that's what Jesus is referred to as, our creator. The one for whom all things were made and exist. He's called the head of the church. Interesting. No mention of an office of the Pope in the Bible. Peter isn't mentioned as the head of the church. He's given a nickname, but that's about it. Certainly had a place of honor among the apostles. He was in the inner circle along with James and John. But Jesus is and remains the head of the church. And then lastly, the firstborn from the dead. If I have to emphasize the firstborn thing anymore, I will. But with that point being made, it's a title of honor. 
among individuals. And note that instead of this being overall creation, it's also from, from the dead. Now, there were others who rose from the dead in a temporal sense. We've got the incident in the Old Testament with Elisha staying with the widow's son. He was raised from the dead. Likewise, we have Jesus raising multiple people from the dead. There was the widow's son. There was the Jewish leader, I believe, Jairus' daughter. We have Lazarus, who is risen from the dead by Jesus. But you think about this and you say, why is Jesus then called the firstborn from the dead? Obviously, he wasn't the first to raise from the dead. I know, it's not chronological. It's talking about a position of honor. Because what made Jesus' re resurrection from the dead different from anyone else's? Lazarus would go on to die again. Jairus' daughter, the widow's son, so on and so forth. All of these people went on to physically live out the rest of their lives and die. But Jesus, when he rose from the dead, died once and now exists in a glorified body forever. And on top of that, because of his resurrection, anyone who trusts in him at his command will also rise for judgment before him as well. So think about that. And by the way, if you want confirmation, Daniel 12, 2 and Acts 17, 31. But we're talking about this point about Jesus, and these titles need to be clarified in context with the rest of Scripture. Because any cult group can come along and say, this is what this means, see it proves my point. No, the point was made fairly eloquent in Scripture. There's a reason why this is in the Bible where it is. Because when it's making all these references to stuff in the past, we need to do it in light of what the Bible says, not what your assumptions make. So, going on from there, if this is who Jesus is, not just in name, not just in title, but in all of these descriptions of his nature, being God himself, and we have him, not only as our example, but indwelt by the Holy Spirit, everything that God is, as much Jesus and the Father, the Holy Spirit is, in you and me. We should share what he's done for us. Just, and as well, those who are before God because of him. We shouldn't settle for less than Jesus. For example, traditions, going beyond the Bible. Legalism, misusing the Bible to build yourself up instead of simply receiving what Jesus has given to you. Or sin, going against the Bible. Now, what gives us the power to do this? The fullness of everything that God is. Jesus himself is not only our advocate, but the Holy Spirit was sent in his name to give us all that he has. And if you have everything that makes God God, not only able to guarantee that you will rise when you die, and I'm not talking about a zombie, we're not talking about voodoo paganism, we're talking about something far more meaningful. We're talking about not only existing forever, we'll all do that, but living forever. Having a life worth living. And the point is being made is this. I'll, I'll just read it. Colossians 2, 8 through 10. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, that's pretty tricky for a lot of people, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to who? To Christ. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything that makes God God is in Jesus. And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. So the point is being made in this. If you're going to take anything away from Colossians, note these points. Who Jesus is and who you should be in light of that reality, since he has given you all that he is. You are equipped for the Christian life. Now, we get the daily choice to either receive or neglect that gift. doesn't mean we will or won't go to heaven. That's on the basis of his mercy. But we can decide whether or not we enjoy this life. And that's only going to happen by his power, which he has freely given to all of us in the spirit. Thank you for your time in listening to this study. If you have any sincere questions, ask them. If you'd like to encourage the ministry, do so. But most importantly,
you know someone who perhaps could use this starting off point in their studies in Colossians or just in Scripture in general, please share it with anyone you feel would be blessed by it. Thank you for your time and listening to the study. Remember that Jesus loves you and that he has far more in store for you than anything this world could even hope to offer. Not just as a counterfeit, but as a guarantee. One that he sealed on the cross.